So, first of all, let me explain why I even have a right to a voice on Syria. I've studied Arabic back in the 70s at Oxford and uh, have basically devoted the rest of my life to the Middle East. So I began with 10 years working for the British government. So I saw the Middle East through the lens of the British government. And then I switched to British industry. So I saw the Middle East through the lens of British industry. And then I became completely independent and started writing. And so I've now written, what, about 16 books about the Middle East, um, mainly travel guides, very detailed cultural and social travel guides. So that's been my focus. So I would call myself a Middle East travel writer, ultimately. And um, so the reason I wrote this book was because I was actually in Syria back in 2004, commissioned to write um, a very detailed guidebook to Syria. And by chance, I found it was possible for a foreigner like me to come in and buy a chunk of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And I thought, that's crazy. How can that possibly be? <laughs> um, that if, that, if that really is going to be possible, then I'm going to do it. So, of course, that was before the revolution. So I, I embarked upon a scheme, which I'm going to take you through now on a journey, basically, into Syria to show you the Syria that I have learnt to know. Uh, I've, I've known Syria since the 1970s, but obviously I only became deeply embedded in Syrian society when, uh, after buying this house and everything that happened there. So the book is the journey of the house, and interwoven with that is the story of the Syrian revolution, how it grew up, the complexities of Syrian society, with a lot of background knowledge about um, Islamic philosophy, Islamic literature, all of that is woven into the story to kind of give you a rich appreciation of what Islamic culture is all about, because I do feel it's very deeply misunderstood in this country. So to do that, I'm going to uh, first of all show you a map. Geography is incredibly important in Syria. It's vital to understand where Syria is on the eastern shore there of the Mediterranean, which tells you really all you need to know. Syria has always been on a crossroads. In all directions, it has been a trading nation. It has been the crisscrossing of so many different civilizations, going right back to the earliest times of man's history. Every single civilization has crisscrossed across this region, and that is what has formed the Syrian identity. It means that Syria, over the centuries, has become multicultural, multi-religious, and multi-ethnic. And that's what's resulted in this very, very complex Syrian society. It's a kind of mosaic. There are so many different elements to it. And in this map, um, the darker areas there are the areas currently of conflict and displacement. And the reason for that, the, so the areas that are not coloured in are basically desert. That's how Syria works. It has an eastern area with desert, which is where Syria's oil and gas fields are. Um, but the rest of the area is actually surprisingly green um, with mountain chains um, and forests. Um, and the population, needless to say, is of course mainly concentrated, therefore, into those more agricultural and, and livable areas. Very, very little of the population actually lives in those desert areas because Syria is not a tribal society. It's very important to understand that's a massive difference between Syria and Iraq. <coughs> Iraq is, is a very tribal society, which is one of the reasons it disintegrated so badly after the American invasion. But Syria has never been like that. It's a very cohesive society, very blended on many levels. So just to show a bit of the geography, um, Damascus, the capital, is right down here, very, very close to the Lebanese border. And that tells you reminds you that, of course, this whole area was under the Ottoman Empire for 400 years, and this whole area was um, the, province, the province of Syria, which included Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, and Palestine. All of that area was, was what was called natural Syria, greater Syria, which, of course, then got carved up after the First World War with all these, as you can see, very unnatural-looking borders. So um, historically, Damascus, therefore, has always had very close links to Lebanon, just like uh, Aleppo, right up in the north there, has always had very close links to Turkey. And 
Aleppo, when it got caught up in the war, it was natural for it to redevelop its trading routes and relocate its factories into Turkey, just like so much of the industry and businesses around Damascus relocated to Lebanon. Then it's important to understand how the different communities um, fit together here, because they, they don't necessarily fall neatly into little categories. So when people talk about partitioning Syria and this kind of thing, it's just not going to work because Syria's not like that. It's much more blended. So although you, in, loosely up in the north, you have um, what's generally referred to as a Kurdish belt because um, about 15% of the Syrian population is Kurdish. And they've, been, they've taken advantage of the, um, the lawlessness, if you like, of the last six years to carve out a territory at the top there for themselves because the Syrian army President Assad's army simply withdrew, just left the vacuum there. So naturally, the Kurds, who'd always been aspiring to a kind of autonomy there, just filled the vacuum and started creating their own zones up there. But of course, um, Turkey was absolutely not going to stand for that, which is why Turkey has now entered the Syrian war and has carved out what it's calling a safe zone right up in the north there um, to make sure that the Kurds can't take over that territory. Um, and they're making very sure, and this fits in well with President Trump's uh, promise to, to build bu big, beautiful safe zones in, uh, in Syria, which he'll get the Gulf countries to pay for. So that will be interesting to watch whether he succeeds in doing that. Um, and of course, the other big players in the Syrian war at the moment are Russia and Iran. Now, Russia's interest in Syria is economic and military. It, it has always supplied the Syrian armed forces with their weaponry, going right back to the 50s. Um, but economic because it, um, it has signed already a huge oil deal for um, the as yet unexcavated oil offshore there on, on Syria's Mediterranean coast. So it signed a 25-year deal to have the rights to, to drill for oil there. Um, and of course, Syria has also given it the opportunity to re-enter the world stage. And Iran, Iran's huge interest in the Syrian war is to expand its, uh, the, the Shia crescent, as it's known, um, across into southern Lebanon, into Hezbollah. It's, uh, it's armed, it's, it's financed and, and trained armed militia, which is a very, very powerful player in, in Lebanon and in Lebanese politics these days. So you've got all these different complexities. Um, the overwhelming population of Syria is Sunni Arab, which is the conventional mainstream Arab grouping, largely a very tolerant kind of Islam, completely opposite to ISIS, which is what has, of course, taken hold there. And um, ISIS, when, it, when ISIS appeared on the scene and took over Raqqa, their headquarters, uh, which you see the big lake up there, and, the, and that river is the Euphrates River running off into Iraq, Raqqa is the first town after that lake. And when ISIS, nearly three years ago now, it's worth remembering just how long ago that was, three years ago, when ISIS took over Raqqa, everybody thought, including Assad himself, well, what does that matter? Such a it's a provincial backwater. Nobody cares at all. But um, they were very clever in doing that because by taking over Raqqa, they were very cleverly um, taking control of the main water source for Syria, the main hydroelectric dam, which is on that uh, lake, and of course, very quickly took over the oil and gas fields, which, as I mentioned, are in that eastern area. So right from the start, they were able to exert an unnatural degree of control over Syria's infrastructure. So, and then the Christian population is about f sort of between 10 and 15%. It's very difficult to get accurate figures. And they are scattered all over the country. And then you have other strange um, minorities like the Druze who, who are scattered in these areas to the south, but also across the cities. Just like the Kurds are also, not just in the north, but scattered all, all around. So it's a very blended society. So nowhere illustrates this blending more to my mind than the old city of Damascus, which is where I bought my house, obviously. And uh, this, this map is in the book. And it shows the walls round the old city, which are still intact, six kilometers circumference. 
Um, all, the, all the gateways, the Roman gateways there, eight of them all around the edges, are still intact, are still in use. And everything, you can get a sense as you walk through Damascus of layer upon layer of civilization. And so everywhere has built on top of the previous uh, civilization. So the military headquarters, for example, that castellated <laughs> building up in the top left-hand corner, has always been the military headquarters of the city. So back in, back in Roman times, it was the Roman castrum, where, where the troops were garrisoned. Then in the Middle Ages, it was the place from which Saladin masterminded the Crusades. And in more recent history, it's been used by the Assad regime as a military prison. And the, the street um, running across the center there is the biblical street called Straight, which is the street that St. Paul was led along when he was blinded and fell from his horse. He was led along that street and up into the Christian quarter um, where he was cured of his sight. And the spiritual heart of the center is that big mosque image there in, this, in the center, at number 11. That has always been the spiritual heart of the city. So it began as a, as a temple to a weather god under the Arameans. And then when the Greeks came, they turned it into a temple of, of Zeus. And then the Romans turned it into a temple of Jupiter. And then the Christians uh, turned it into a cathedral of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist's head is still buried in that building. And then when the Muslims came in the seventh century, they too wanted to use that same space as their spiritual place of worship. And so they came to an arrangement with the Christians to share the building. And so they entered through the same, the same main entrance, the old temple entrance, and the Christians turned one way and the Muslims turned the other. And that arrangement only came to an end when they ran out of space. And then the Muslims said to the Christians, right, we would like now to take over this whole area and make it into our main mosque of the city. And in exchange, we'll give you land for four new churches. So that's what happened, and to this day, those churches are amongst the 17 churches in the Christian quarter there, in the top section, which are all still working, all still functioning in Damascus now. And so on a Sunday morning, you hear church bells ringing out across the city, mingling with the call to prayer. That is how Damascus has always been, incredibly blended. And the house which I bought um, back in 2005 is down there, at number one on the map, mm -hmm. and that is in a, a Sunni Shia mixed area. So the building I've just been describing, that, um, that spiritual heart of Damascus, looks like this now. This is the mosque that the Muslims built back in the seventh century. And you can see straight away how blended that is, just looking at it with the dome there, which is reminiscent of the Byzantine. Um, uh, style of architecture and the gable there taken from the Hellenistic period and then the tall minaret there which looks could be a bell tower or church spire is in fact called the Jesus minaret because local tradition has it that on the final day of judgment Christ will descend from that minaret so this is very typical of the, of the natural blending of all the traditions in Damascus and it's normal at Christmas and at Easter for Muslims to go into the churches, and it's normal for Christians to go into the mosques. All the mosques in Syria are open to everybody. You can go in there. I've spent hours in the courtyard of this mosque, just sitting there. You know, you can have a picnic. People just enjoy themselves. <coughs> Children run around, treat it like a playground. It's a very, very relaxing, sort of like a, a kind of a safe haven. Mm. Now, this is the same building in the depths of winter, because it's easy to forget that Damascus is actually very high. It's at 800 meters, and so in the winter, um, I took this picture actually just um, in the winter of last year, when in, in January, when the temperature dropped to minus 15. So snow of this type is, is not unusual. And the reason I'm showing it to you is that in, in Damascus itself, there is no actual fighting going on at the moment. The fighting is all in the suburbs. The center is safe because it's so tightly under the grip of the Assad regime. But the, the infrastructure problems, which I explained are largely to do with, with ISIS, um, affect even the center of Damascus. So even in the center where there's no fighting, they still only have about three or four hours of electricity. They have almost no gas, almost no, um, no heating fuel. 
and the water supply gets regularly blockaded um, by rebel groups up in the hills, in the mountains where the main source comes from. And so at this point, um, all these water tanks, those red tanks there, are water tanks on the roof, and all of them burst at that time, which was an absolute catastrophe for people living in Damascus. Um, but the way Syrians deal with this, and this is another very important thing, is they laugh. They're just, they have this incredible, uncomplaining aspect to them. They, they, they just accept whatever's thrown at them, and they don't let it get them down. They actually laugh about it. So uh, a friend of mine rang recently and was laughing and saying, oh, um, I was woken up at three in the morning by the sound of the water pump pumping the water up on, onto the roof. And so I leapt out of bed and rushed to the shower because I knew that that was going to be the only time that month when both the water and the electricity were both on together. So it was going to be my only chance to wash my hair that month. And they just laugh about this. They, they, they just you know, don't complain at all. Now, this is the facade of that same mosque. And I'm showing you this because this is one of the earliest examples of Islamic art. And you can see. Uh, straight away that the, the imagery of it, the iconography, is also this very blended aspect. They've taken in aspects of Christianity and the earlier Hellenistic civilizations. So, but what it's aiming to do, like most Islamic art, is to project a vision of paradise. And so the iconography tends to be trees and gardens and fantasized buildings and rivers. And uh, but the, the echoes of Christianity come in the, the triple arched window, you know, the echoes of the Trinity there, and the columns here taken from the classical sites, which they'll have seen all over Syria as well. And the damage there is um, from a random shell. As I mentioned, the center of Damascus is basically safe, but every now and again a random shell is fired in from the suburbs that just happens to land somewhere, and this one landed on that facade. But it's been repaired already. Um, the quality of Syrian craftsmen is phenomenal. And it's been repaired to a very, very high standard. I, I, I checked when I was last there, and it has been all repaired. So unfortunately, the suburbs of Damascus, completely different story. Um, they've just been pulverized by the Assad government for having the temerity to stand up against him and to ask for, for freedoms and for reforms to his highly corrupt system, which is completely gripped by a security state, basically. Um, for the last 45, 50 years, Syria has been under the grip of the Assad family, and um, there's been no such thing as, as free speech, largely. I mean, if you dared to criticize the system in any way, you'd be plucked off the streets and you'd disappear into prison. And so people learned to be quiet, basically. They learned to, to be silent. And so I refer quite a lot in the book to the silent majority, because at the moment, most Syrians fall into that category. They are the silent majority. They're not with Assad, and they're not with ISIS, obviously. They are stuck between these two extremes, and that's what's so tragic about their situation. So at this time, when all the suburbs were being pulverized, um, this is when a lot of my friends started to lose their homes. And so uh, this is the point at which I offered them my house to come and uh, stay as a, as a safe haven. Um, now, of course, this is the sort of image that the media is always showing us. And the media is a, is a topic I want to touch on um, because it is important to understand because course, all our perceptions about what's going on in Syria come from the media, whether we like it or not. And so it's all a question of what media we look at and what we allow to influence us. And of course, ISIS have a head of media. He's a 33-year-old Syrian-American. He's a genius, and they pay him a fortune to produce very, very clever images like this, which project this massive sense of power, of the power of ISIS. And of course, here they're using the stage building of the Roman theater in Palmyra to project this image onto the world stage of their power. And so they've lined up a group of Syrian soldiers there, and behind them are teenagers who are about to behead the soldiers. And you know, they've been sending out 90,000 tweets a day uh, with something like 30,000 Twitter accounts. Very, very active. And they've com they completely um, were way, way ahead of any other 
any other um, force involved in this war. So they were able to project the amount of power that they had <coughs> quite, quite disproportionately. And of course, what they were seeking to destroy in Palmyra is precisely what I've been explaining about this blended multicultural society. Because Palmyra, a caravan city in the middle of the desert there, on all the trading routes, because it's been Rome on its eastern fringe there, it's where Rome blended with the Babylonian and Mesopotamian cultures and with the Persian cultures and the ancient Egyptian cultures. And that res resulted in a, in a special fusion of the cultures uh, to create the Palmyran civilization, which is unique. It had its own language, they had their own style of dress, their own hairstyles, their own jewelry, um, all of which shows in their statues. And that's precisely, of course, what ISIS wanted to destroy. So, of course, that building that we just saw has, was blown up like that in an image which they then tweeted all around the world to again show how powerful they were. But of course, it's not only ISIS who's been using the Syrian war as a propaganda tool. Russia and Putin have, it's been an absolute gift to him. And if you watch Russian TV, which I do quite a lot these days, RT on Freeview, you know, channel 135, anybody can get it. It's such an eye opener to see how they, how, misin how misinformation is, is done. It's very, very clever. So of course, when Russia took, retook Palmyra from ISIS, um, they immediately saw what a propaganda coup this was because the world has always been fascinated by, by the mystique of Palmyra. And so Russia bust in a, um, a special orchestra for this victory concert in the very same building, the Roman theatre, that ISIS was doing its staged beheading. Russia is now doing its staged victory concert. It forced people to come into the audience along with some of its own soldiers and then Putin has himself put in on a video link to project himself to the world as the savior of Syria, the defender of terrorism. And it's very clever stuff, and it works. But of course, what we didn't hear about at all is what was going on in Palmyra before Russia and before ISIS. Because these pictures are from 2013, well before um, any of that happened, when in fact this damage was caused by the Syrian government itself because it, it was firing on a small group of rebels who had set up a, a, a small headquarters inside the Temple of Bel, which has big high walls, so it's quite fortified. So it made a, a sort of natural defensive spot. But the Syrian government thought nothing of going up onto the hill that overlooks the site and shelling its own cultural heritage and causing all this destruction. And you can see here, uh, these are Syrian tanks moving around within the ruins heavy trucks, they, they put a, a multiple rocket launcher in the temple of Diocletian, they didn't think twice about it. But these pictures were taken very um, secretly on the ground by Syrian activists who recorded it. Because of course, Assad has been very, very careful to make sure that journalists don't get in to Syria. These days you have Russian journalists and Iranian journalists who cover the angles um, that they want covered, and it was very, very clear all during the Aleppo campaign that that's precisely what was going on. The Assad regime doesn't invite journalists in unless it's got something it wants to show them, which it did just before the fall of Aleppo, because it wanted to show them exactly at that moment how the city was falling and how, how they were providing all this humanitarian aid. And then, of course, it makes them all go out again before the ugly end game, when it then bombs the place completely into smithereens. So it's very, very tightly controlled. I mean, Syria has, for the last five years in a row, topped the bill of the most dangerous place for journalists, because there is no free journalism um, from, from international outlets. It's so that Syrian activists have trained themselves up. They have people who were not at all, um, you know, in that field have become um, photojournalists and activists on the ground. So this is another one of Syria's UNESCO World Heritage Sites. This is the Crac de Chevalier. It's the world's best preserved crusader castle. And it's got caught up in the conflict for the same reason that Palmyra got caught up. It's strategic location, because the reason it's, it's there in the first place, just like the reason Palmyra's there in the first place is because of the, the, the trade, routes, trade routes converging, 
Here, um, the castle is guarding what's called the Homps Gap, which is a natural break in the mountain chain, the only break from the in interior desert to the coast. And so strategically, it's a very important place. And so at the start of the revolution, a group of rebels with the full consent of the local villagers took up uh, a position inside. And of course, the Syrian air force immediately came and bombarded it from above. And it's one of those many ironies in the Syrian war that so much of its cultural heritage has come through unscathed. I mean, this castle was never taken throughout. It was built in the 12th century. It was never taken, was never damaged until now when it got bombed by its own government. Other sites get caught up for their strategic location. So this is a monastery right up on the top uh, in the Kalamun Mountains at 2,000 feet, 2,000 meters high, um, right on the border between Lebanon and Syria. And so this monastery, the Syrian government came in and kicked out the monks and took over. And again, you can see how the monastery there was originally a Greek temple, all the style, you know, you can, the size of the blocks, all of this is Hellenistic masonry with the columns there. So it's another example of, a, of an ancient site which has evolved with each new civilization. So the monks have been kicked out and it's been turned into an army barracks because strategically they want to command the high, the high points up there. But you then get cases like this. This is another church in Matlula, and some of you may have heard of Matlula. It's always paraded in the press as the place where the language of Christ, Aramaic, is still spoken. But Matlula is of no strategic interest to anybody. It's tucked into a little cleft down in the mountains. Um, it doesn't command anything at all. And this is a classic case of media manipulation because the timing of this was just before, if you remember, there was that big chemical attack, chemical weapons attack um, in the east of Damascus, and that almost led Obama to intervene in the Syrian case. And it really did look at one stage as if Obama was going to enter, you know, his red line had been crossed and he was going to actually intervene and bomb ISIS. Uh, Assad and Assad was so worried at that point that this might really happen and that this would be the end of him that he engineered a crisis here in Matlula, knowing that the world would pay attention to what happens in Matlula, and so he engineered an attack like this um, and then showed it to the media and showed his own army coming in to to save the the inhabitants and. Uh, the, the nuns and the monks in the village. This is a, this is a monastery, a, a famous monastery that's been burnt out. And he said, uh, look, if, if, you, if, you, if you get rid of me, look what's going to happen. Terrorism will run over the whole country. I am the only defender of the minorities here. And of course, it worked. It worked. Obama backed off. You know, the parliament here didn't vote to go along with it. And afterwards, the nuns in the village uh, actually said, we, the army, the Syrian army, sold us to the media. It was a clear case. And again, this is another example of where Western journalists were invited in to be shown, look, look, look at this destroyed church. Look what will happen if you get rid of me. And it, it's very effective. It, it works. And this is in Homs. This is another church in Homs, again, bombarded by aerial bombardment. You may remember it's so long ago now. This seems to have been going on so long that in 2012, when all this was going on, this is where Marie Colvin in the Sunday Times journalist, you know, where she was killed when the center, the old city of Homs was being aerial bombarded and completely, completely destroyed. And that was the first of the many starve or surrender sieges, basically, where um, the whole area was completely destroyed. So to get down to the sort of personal level now with the house, um, I'll just show you a few images of the house. Um, this, as, as the map showed, is in the center of the old city of Damascus. So this is within the UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a courtyard house. Damascus has uh, the world's largest collection of old residential Ottoman architecture. So this house dates back, it's blended like everything in Syria, it's blended between the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. Different sides of the courtyard are from different centuries because it's been continuously inhabited so that it's already come through wars, invasions, earthquakes, fires, all of that. And so the city has been constantly being rebuilt. 
And so you can see it looks in a pretty sorry state here. It was actually inhabited when I bought it, um, and it was sort of just about possible to, uh, to live there. So this is now August of 2005, when the temperature is 40 degrees. And uh, so this is, I was sort of semi-camping in the house, um, waiting for the bureaucracy to kick in. So this was my first real exposure to Syrian bureaucracy and how everything works. And that Syrian bureaucracy is like a labyrinth. It combines the worst of the Ottoman and the worst of the French. And so my, um, my task now was to find myself um, a bank manager who turned out to be a Christian lady. I had to find myself a lawyer who turned out to be a Sunni Kurd. I had to find myself an architect who was a, um, a Sunni Arab. And the architect and I gathered together a team of about 15 Syrian craftsmen um, to embark on the restoration project, which, which took three years. So this is what we had to do at the start. We had to rip off all of those walls around the courtyard were covered with a white uniform cement masking everything underneath. And that, in the book, becomes a kind of metaphor for the Assad regime, which has been suffocating the true nature of Syria and its true identity for the last 50 years. And so the first thing we had to do was pull that off. And what we found underneath was this, um, these mud bricks, um, which I call the mud of Mesopotamia, because these this mud and this style of house goes right back to the earliest Mesopotamian times. It's evolved to be perfectly adapted to the climate. And these mud bricks keep the heat in in the winter and the heat out in the summer. And so this is like a perfect eco house. In fact, this arch here is the open iwan, as it's called, that faces onto the courtyard, always north facing, so that when you sit there in the summer, the sun never shines directly into it and it always catches the breezes. So it is perfectly evolved for the climate. You don't need air conditioning in these houses. So this is in the depths of the restoration, in where this is absolute chaos, as you can see. Everything doesn't look as if anything is ever going to get any better. But the extraordinary thing about this period was that all of us really enjoyed ourselves. We, we, we all knew what we were striving for. So again, this is the state that Syria is locked in at the moment. It's completely chaotic. It doesn't look as if it's ever going to get any better. And yet the people inside Syria who have stayed behind are remarkably cohesive. I've seen it firsthand. And so here is the electrician who's coming across with the kettle to, um, to have one of our many tea breaks. You can see all the glasses there, tea glasses, lined up along the, the side of the fountain. And this is some of the detailing of the interior and the rooms. So you can see this dates to 1700. This is what I call the Ajami room. This is hand-painted wooden lacquer work. And you can see again how they've taken in elements from earlier civilizations, that gold acanthus leaf up in the corner there is straight off the sort of Hellenistic blocks of, of Palmyra. Um, and the iconography again is gardens, gardens, flowers, little, little birds hidden in the trees. And on those green panels, that is not inscriptions from the Quran, that is a Sufi poem, uh, Sufism being the mystic, uh, mystic Islam, which Syrian Islam is very close to that. It, it's a very kind of moderate, tolerant version of Islam. And this is a Sufi poem invoking blessings on the house and on the owner. <coughs> and this is another um, detail of the interior. This is what I refer to as the secret ceiling, which comes to represent a sort of tapestry of Syrian society, the way all the different elements are, are blended together. And again, you can see harkbacks um, to the earlier civilizations. So things like that, that is the Rose of Palmyra, taken straight off the carved blocks of Palmyra. And you can see how strangely familiar that looks in some ways, because that top and bottom um, borders there could be taken straight from a William Morris catalogue. It could be curtains, you know, curtain material or, or, or um, wallpaper. And that's no accident. That's because British um, mm. architects went out to Palmyra and did deta detailed drawings back in the 18th century of the patterns that they found in Palmyra, brought them back to this country, published them, and that stimulated the neoclassical revival in this country. 
um, which is why we see this kind of thing all over our country houses all across Britain. And here again is, uh, this would have been covered with the white uniform cement that I'm talking about. Um, but in removing that, of course, you cause some damage. And if you can see that hole up there, um, just to the left, there's a big hole in, in the stonework there. And I took a very conscious decision with the restoration of the house not to over-restore, not to aim for some sort of unnatural perfection, um, but to leave that kind of thing. Because it, 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 if you like, it, it's a kind of scar. Just like Syria will have to take in many, many scars um, and absorb them and, and look them in the eye, actually, and say, right, these, this is damage which has been done, but we have to now absorb that and make it part of our future identity. And in, in the blending, again, that I've mentioned, right at the very top there, you, quite difficult to see, but there is actually what we would think of as a Jewish Star of David, and in two interlocking triangles right at the top there. But in, in Damascus, that is nothing to do with a specifically Jewish symbol. That is actually locally known as the Shield of Solomon. And again, it's just a symbol to protect the house. So at the end of the three years, this is what we ended up with. Um, everything perfectly restored. Wherever there were things missing, like, for example, the, um, the little bronze heads there in the fountain, we would go to salvage yards around the outskirts of the city and source them from there. So the only new things that came into this house were the infrastructure. Just as in Syria, that's what has to happen. The, the faulty wiring, if you like, and the faulty drains and plumbing, all of that has to be ripped out, just like in, in the Assad regime, the corrupt um, and malfunctioning bureaucracy of the security state, of the torture systems, uh, all of that, and, and the people who've got their fingers in all the pies at the top, all of that has to be ripped out. And then Syria can be what it should be, this multi-layered, very, very beautiful and complex society. But moving on now to ISIS again, um, one of the things that's been happening all over Syria is looting of the cultural heritage. And ISIS has again seen in, in the cultural heritage uh, an opportunity to make money. And of course it's making money um, from, uh, because the oil that it's been controlling, it has tacit under the table deals with the Assad regime. So Assad continues to buy oil from his own oil wells through ISIS. Um, and they just take a rake off, just like with the um, cultural heritage here, they take a rake off of 20% and the stuff gets fed onto the international art market. But every now and again, when they dig up something so massive like this um, 7th century BC Assyrian statue, of course that's far too huge to be passed off on the art market, so they use it instead for propaganda purposes and they publicly smash it to bits and then tweet it all around the world to, again, make themselves seem so powerful. And they force the local population to come and watch this. So if you can see the expression on that little boy's face, who's being made to watch his own cultural heritage being destroyed like that. It's just pure agony, because Syrians care very, very deeply about their cultural heritage. It's like having part of their soul erased. And Aleppo, this is Aleppo before the, um, uh, before the fall of it, obviously. Um, so this is, as it used to be, w um, Syria's commercial hub, one of the most famous souks in the whole of the Arab world, and then afterwards when it caught fire. And the reason it caught fire was because, again, the government, the Syrian government, shelled <coughs> a rebel headquarters in the old city and it hit an electricity substation that caught fire, spread through all the shops, and overnight, 40,000 people were made bankrupt. But of course, what we don't hear about is what Syrians on, are doing on the ground about this. And this is a picture of two archaeology students from Aleppo University. And nobody's paying them to do this. They are volunteers, and they are of their own accord building a protective wall in front of the shrine of Zechariah, the tomb of Zechariah, who's the father of John the Baptist, and his tomb <coughs> is inside the Aleppo Emmaid Mosque. And this is happening all over Syria. Mm -hmm. Syrians on the ground are trying to protect, in whatever way they can, their own cultural heritage. 
And the same thing here. This is right down in the south, another one of um, Syria's UNESCO World Heritage Sites. This is Bosra, one of the world's best preserved uh, Roman amphitheaters. And you should never be misled by what people look like in the Syrian war, because you could look at that group of people there and think they were a bunch of jihadi extremists. But in fact, the guy in the middle with the red beard is the local history teacher who set up a revolutionary antiquities department. And the people around him are in charge of the local militias, where they have gathered together the local population to protect the city. Because when they saw what happened in Palmyra, they all vowed that this was not going to happen to Bosra. And so to end with now, just this is a picture of um, some of the families who were in my house. As I mentioned, um, when, when they lost their own homes around the outside, they, um, I invited them to move in. And so I had five families, different families, living in the house. Obviously, I wasn't there anymore. I'd come back to, to this country. And um, of course, it's very difficult. Um, five families who don't know each other, um, all having to share the same house. Some were virtually illiterate. Um, some were university educated. So it's not a natural blend. They've only got one kitchen, two bathrooms, and then there are lots of arguments about who is paying the electricity, who's paying the water, because believe it or not, people are still expected to pay the bills even in the middle of the war. Um, so there was a lot of arguing and, and, and um, aggravation in the first couple of months. But then all that settled down when they gradually got used to each other. And the wonderful thing was that they ended up the best of friends. And so these four children are actually from four different families who have all stayed very, very close to each other. And this is one of the things about war. One has to realize that although all we see on the, on the screens the whole time is the, the awfulness of war, the damage, war pushes you out of your comfort zone in a way that um, can be actually very productive. And a lot of my friends in Syria um, about half of whom are still inside the country. The other half are scattered around Turkey, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, and some of them have made it to Germany. They all, um, they all feel you know, that this has been uh, a, an incredible experience for them. They've all done things that they would never have dreamt of doing. So they've got themselves new qualifications. Um, they've entered fields they would never have done before. A lot of the women, for example, I mean, there are far fewer women um, f far too many women, almost, in, in, um, in Damascus these days, uh, because so many of the men have left or been killed. Um, and so the women are finding themselves rather like with the world wars in this country, you know, being forced to go out and do things that they would never have done ordinarily. So there have been many, many positives to the whole thing. So I just want to end by saying that um, uh, the book actually supports a, a special charity for um, a special fund for Syrian higher education so that Syrians who've had their, um, their university studies interrupted can continue them outside of Syria. Because it, the vital thing is that at the end of all of this, that there must be um, an elite of highly trained Syrians to, who can bring the country back. Because Syria is such a gifted society. I mean, so many, so many of our inventions come from that part of the world, going right back to the alphabet. The first musical notation was invented there. So many scientific inventions. Um, um, you know, uh, it, it, the list is almost endless. You know, the, the, the division of, of minutes into 60, you know, 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds massive numbers of things actually come from this part of the world. It's a highly creative society. And, um, you know, Steve Jobs was, um, you know, an obvious example whose birth father was Syrian. There are <coughs> they have a kind of natural adaptability. It's part of the culture, part of the identity, that because they've always had this blending. It's a real argument for multiculturalism, in my view. It shows that because of all that blending, you, you can become a much richer society. And that is how Syrian society always has been, and remarkably still is, although you don't hear about it. It's still very, very cohesive. And so it deserves all our support. So, so try to remember you know, when you hear the news that in the middle there are, is this silent majority of the vast majority of the Syrian population who are currently stuck between Assad and ISIS, who, of course, never have fought each other that's the other massive irony in this. They've never fought each other. They've just been intent on wiping out the moderate Syrian opposition in the middle. And that's, that's why we're in this tragic situation at the moment. 
but uh, as I said, it's not, it's not entirely without hope because I do think that you know, there will be a massive rebirth at the end of all of this. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Diana. This is an incredible talk on a very, very timely subject. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, if anyone would like to ask one. Thank you for the talk. I actually had two maybe linked questions. The first is, after the death of someone like Asif Shalkat, the sanctions against Remy Maklouf, what does the sort of inner circle around um, Assad look like now? Like, how strong is he? And perhaps also linked to that, after the gassing, um, if the Americans and coalition forces had intervened at that point, do you think we could have toppled Assad and would something better be in its place? Well, just to start with that, with the last one, um, I have been consistently of the view that we should have intervened, actually even before that, the chemical attack. Um, I think we should have gone in right at the, in the summer of 2011 when the Syrians were begging us to come in and when we'd gone into Libya. And so that, that's what gave them the courage to actually stand up and, and to, to go out on all their peaceful demonstrations. Because it's, again, it's worth remembering that for the first four to six months, it was peaceful. You know, the demonstrations were peaceful, but they just got shot, you know. They just got gunned down. Peaceful demonstrators got gunned down. That's what turned the whole thing into an armed, an armed uprising. But then when the Free Syrian Army rose up spontaneously that first summer in 2011, mainly made up of defectors from Assad's army, they were begging us to come in. Come in, please help us make a safe zone along the Turkish border where we can go and where we can be protected. If we had done that then, ISIS would never have existed because ISIS didn't come along until 2013. You know, the vacuum was there for two years, but we did nothing. And so ISIS would not have been able to get its toehold there in Syria. It meant that the whole refugee crisis would not have existed. There would have been no need for all those people to come to Europe, to destabilize Europe, you know, and all the terrorism and everything that's, you know, that we now associate with Syria. None of that needed to happen. And as for his inner circle, this is a very, very interesting question. I mean, so many people have said, you know, surely, surely somebody's going to assassinate him, you know, <laughs> or, um, you know, as after that bomb in which Asif Shalkat was killed, that was the moment at which a lot of my Syrian friends thought, right, that's it, I've got to leave, because we know now it's going to get really ugly, because his, his retaliation for that is going to be massive. And so that is actually where most of my friends left and went to Turkey or wherever, where they have now carved out entirely new lives for themselves. But the interesting thing is now, as the, as the war has wound on, you know, and, and Assad has, the only reason Assad is still there, of course, is because Iran, has been supporting him to a massive degree. They've been lending him money. They've been training up um, his, uh, this, this massive paramilitary force of the National Defense Forces, 100,000 people. You know, they're doing the fighting and Hezbollah. The Syrian army itself has been so weakened. It's really, really weak. It would have fallen. And, but even with all that help from Iran, it would still have fallen. And Russia could see that, which is why it then came into the war as well, you know, just over a year ago, um, to make sure that Assad didn't fall. I mean, the man would have been gone by now if it hadn't been. And this is without our help. You know, we did nothing. They got very little help, the moderate rebels. We did nothing. And Assad had all that help from Iran, all that help from Russia, you know. It, it's a miracle, frankly, that there's still anything left of the Syrian opposition. But it is still there, and it's not going to go away. So all this sort of stuff about, um, you know, maybe Assad is the lesser of two evils is just so short-sighted. You know, there's no way. And people forget, you know, the, the deaths in Syria, close to half a million. It's very difficult to document them, and the UN stopped counting so long ago. But, you know, the deaths, 95% of the deaths have been caused by the Assad regime. You know, people imagine it's all ISIS. ISIS has been responsible for a tiny number of deaths. It's all got disproportionately, you know, we, we see it through this lens of terrorism now, that we're all so frightened of the terrorism that we think that ISIS is the problem. ISIS isn't the problem. ISIS is the result of the problem, you know, that we didn't deal with right at the start. Yeah, but so tragically, his, his, his group is being held in position, you know, by Iran and and Russia, and they're not going to go away. So what, what's next for Syrian people who have gone to Europe 
what what would be required to uh, entice these people to return to Syria to help rebuild the country? Every single Syrian I know would go back to Syria like a shot if it were safe for them to do so. Every single one. I mean, it's remarkable how how they have such a deep connection to their homeland. Huge. You know, I mean, I've got friends who've now been in Germany for two to three years. They've been taught German. You know, they, they, they've tried to integrate. It's very difficult to get work. They would go back. They want to go back. They're so closely in touch with everything that's going on. And um, so that, that this is what gives me hope, to be honest, that um, it will rebuild. It will rebuild. And let's hope that Trump manages to build, you know, some big, beautiful safe zones <laughs> and gets the Saudis to pay for them. Because that would be terrific if he could achieve that. But, um, you know, pigs might fly. We'll see. You know. <laughs> and on that note, um, please join me in thanking Diana Darka for her fabulous talk.